picture this. You're standing in a wine store surrounded by shelves of liquid mystery. You pick up a bottle of wine and you squint at the label. Is it a Cabernet? A Shiraz? What on earth is this? And why is it so expensive? Frustration sets in and you're wondering, why can't they make it easier to understand? Do you always find yourself gravitating towards the wines that you know, simply because the labels tell you what they are and you know what to understand? We've all been there, but fear not, because we're about to embark on a journey to decipher these wine labels. By the end of this video, you'll be decoding these fancy words like a pro. So grab a glass of wine because learning is always more fun with a glass in hand and let's dive in. First things first, a wine label is like a producer's Instagram profile. It's their opportunity to get you ooing and eyeing and to get people talking and ultimately to sell their craft. Some terms and phrases are legally defined in certain areas, regions and countries. For example, the term all vines on a Barossa wine means that the vines were a minimum of 35 years old. But in other parts of Australia and France, nope, no such rules. It's free for all, but most quality and reputable producers would pretty much stick to the 30 years and above range when using the term old vines on their wine labels. For us, the consumers, a wine label should provide all the legally required information depending on where we're at and hopefully enough information to give us a clue as to what to expect from the wine. But we know that it's not that easy. Things always get tangled when you have the law, culture and tradition all colliding together. Each country and sometimes different regions and areas have their own laws and regulations. To simplify things, we'll focus on key geographical labelling laws of the EU and compare them with some of the major new world wine producers. And we'll also highlight some of the key focuses of some of these wine-loving nations. For starters, let's take a look at two different wine labels and identify some of the common information that's almost always available on all bottles. First, we have the brand or producer or winery name. This is the superstar responsible for crafting the wine. They might have grown the grapes themselves or purchased them from other vineyards. They could even have bottled the wine themselves or had someone else do the honours. But one thing's for sure, they made magic happen. Next up is a sense of place. Think of it as the wine's hometown, its roots. It could be as broad as a country or as specific as a single vineyard. It might also be a commune, village, district or region, subject to the local laws and regulations. It's like the DNA of the wine, shaped by its unique terroir. A common feature on both New World labels and Old World countries and regions like Germany, Austria and Alsace is the grape variety or blend. If you don't see any grape details on the front label, flip the bottle around and check the back or side label. Keep your ears perked because we'll be tossing around terms like Old and New World quite frequently in this video and if you'd like to learn about what makes a wine fall within these categories, do check out my video up here. Then there's the vintage. This is the year that those magnificent grapes were grown and harvested. And if there's no vintage mention, it means that the wine is a blend of different wines from different years. Sneaky, right? And here's a fun fact about a champagne. Champagnes which are non-vintage are actually blends of wine from different years. We'll spot the volume listed too, typically 750 milliliters or 75 centiliters. Sometimes they come in half bottles or something smaller. Sweet wines often come in smaller bottles because let's face it, we don't guzzle them like there's no tomorrow. And once open, their lifespan shrinks faster than Cinderella's pumpkin carriage. The alcohol by volume or ABV tells us the percentage of pure ethanol in the wine. It gives us some clues about the wine's body and style. Some of us even feel a certain allure to higher alcohol content. Don't worry, no judgments here. And for traceability purposes, the label always includes the contact details of the producer, bottler and or importer. It's like having their business card on the wine label. And do keep an eye out for any extra special touches like relevant certifications, awards or critic points. They're like gold stars for the wine shouting, hey, I'm organic or look at me, I won an award. Now let's dive into the world of wine regions and their undeniable impact on wine quality. 
Wine can be made anywhere and everywhere, but it's all about location, location, and location that gives the wine its extra sparkle. This is traditionally known as terroir. You might have come across fancy terms such as delimited areas, regions, or geographical indications, and they all simply mean that the grapes were grown and the wines made in a specific area. When an area is officially recognized and protected by law, it becomes a wine appellation. Different countries have their own names for it, like the renowned Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée in France, Denominación de Origen in Spain, Wine of Origin in South Africa, or Geographic Indications in Australia. No matter the name, it all boils down to capturing the essence of the sense of place in the bottle of wine. Wine appellations come in all shapes and sizes. Some span across vast territories, like the entire country of America, whilst others are as petite as a single vineyard, such as the celebrated Chateau Grier in Northern Rhone, famous for their luscious viognes that coat your palate like liquid silk. Let's look at EU laws governing wine appellations. Broadly speaking, wines can be broken down into three generic quality tiers, the bottom of which would be wines without any geographical indications, and these are usually countrywide wines followed by those that have protected geographical indications, known as PGI. These wines come from large, specified areas. At the top are wines with protected designation of origin, or PDO, that come from even smaller areas. Different EU countries have different local names for these, and some have subdivisions within these. The Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, or TTB, oversees America's Appellation of Origin system, in the example of a countrywide appellation like America, at least 75% of the grapes must have been grown anywhere in the country, whilst the remaining 25% could even be imported from, say, China. Within these appellations, there are smaller subregions and communes which hold their own prestigious appellation status. Take the Medoc, for example, a captivating subregion of the Bordeaux on the left bank of the Gironde estuary. It's home to four of Bordeaux's greatest communes, Saint Estephe, Poyac, Saint Julian, and Margot, each with its distinct characteristics and wines that captivate connoisseurs worldwide. Now let's talk about the Creme de la Creme. Some of these ultra prestigious appellations produce some of the finest and most coveted wines in the world. Some are so small and exclusive that they're like the unicorns of the wine world. Take the Monopole Romani Conti, for instance, a tiny plot of 1.8 hectares, magically producing some of the rarest and most expensive wines in the world. Wine enthusiasts swoon with excitement and fight to pay well over $20,000 for one of these unicorns. And what's a Monopole? It's a term that's widely used in Burgundy, although not exclusive to it, which simply means that a winery has complete control over the entire wine appellation. This is the case of the legendary Domaine de la Romanie Conti, widely abbreviated as DRC. But if you want to be part of these wine appellations and label your wines as such, there are strict rules to follow. From the way the grapes are grown to how the wine is made, everything is regulated. They decide which grapes can be grown and in what proportions, when the grapes can be harvested, and even how much wine can be made from a hectare of land. It's like they're running a tight ship to ensure that only the best wines make it to the market. After all, it's all about reputation, reputation, and reputation. I visited Chateau du Camp several years ago, and over a tasting session, one of the employees shared that on the rare few occasions where certain vintages exceeded the permitted yields, they simply gave those extra grapes away. Now, although those grapes couldn't be sold as sautern, lucky whoever it was who got those grapes and got to make them into wine. And let's not forget about aging requirements, barrel types and labelling guidelines. These appellations mean business when it comes to quality control. They want to make sure that you're getting the real deal and not some imposter trying to ride their coattails. And here's a fun fact. Appellations are not confined to wines alone. You'll find them protecting the quality and uniqueness of other agricultural products. Think of them as protective shields that protect us from fake cheeses, counterfeit coffees or phony olive oils. Even the legendary Kobe beef 
has its own appellation to ensure its unparalleled taste and authenticity. When it comes to top quality French wines, three powerhouses come into play, or I like to call them the two B's and C, Bordeaux, Burgundy and Champagne. However, we'll leave Champagne aside for now because its classification system was abolished in 2004. So if you do stumble across Champagne labels with terms such as Grand or Premier Cru, it no longer carries any legal or qualitative significance. In the world of Bordeaux, there's a legendary classification back from 1855, which is still a big deal 168 years later. Terms like Premier Grand Cru Classé and Grand Cru Classé indicate that the producers of these wines are amongst the creme de la creme of Bordeaux and in the entire world. Unlike most other parts of the world where it's about individual plots of vineyards, Burgundy included, in Bordeaux, the entire producer, that is the estate or chateau, are rated from first to fifth growth. Out of approximately 5,600 chateaus, only 61 made the cut. That's the top 1% of the club. And guess what? There are only five chateaus that enjoy the prestigious status of first growth. The five greats are Rothschild, Latour, Mouton Rothschild, Chateau Margaux, and the one and only chateau from outside of the meadow is Haute-Briand. And what's more unique about Chateau Haute-Briand is that it is the only estate that has been classified under not one, but two prestigious systems. It is a premier Grand Cru Classé wine, and at the same time, a Grand Cru Classé wine of the Graves classification of 1959. Now, if you come across the term Cru Bourgeois, it's regulated by law, and it's one step below the 1855 classification. Historically speaking, Getting promoted to the 1855 classification is almost impossible, like finding a unicorn in a haystack. In 168 years, there's only been one promotion, and that honour went to Mouton Rothschild, which was an existing second growth, which ascended to a first growth. So for the remaining 99% of chateaus, no matter how much they improve on their quality, prestige and reputation, the only avenue for them would be to apply for Cru Bourgeois status. It's like the underdog category which doesn't have the same level of fame, but amongst them are hidden gems which offer top quality but without the hefty price tags. This is an annual rating system where Medoc producers submit individual wines to undergo rigorous blind tastings and production controls. Where successful, the specific vintage is awarded one of the three quality categories, Cru Bourgeois, Cru Bourgeois Superiors, and Cru Bourgeois Exceptionals. Shifting gears to Burgundy and Alsace, where it's all about location, location, location. Here, it's specific plots of vineyards that steal the show. In Burgundy, the vineyards are like individual artists, each showcasing their own characteristics and terroir. The creme de la creme are Grand Cru's, and a step below them, Premier Cru's, equally as talented, but perhaps slightly more humble. Over in Alsace, the Grand Cru sites make up a teeny tiny 4% of the total regional production. They're like the hidden gems, but at lower price tags in comparison to that of Burgundy and Bordeaux. Now let's head over to Spain, Germany and Austria, where their classification systems bear some semblance to that of Burgundy. In Spain, forget about being a vice president because Vino di Pago is the top dog. Out of 4,300 plus wineries, only 20 vineyards make it to the coveted Vino di Pago status. They are the gold star standard of Spanish vineyard plots, giving Burgundy Grand Cruz a run for their money, but with grapes such as Tempranillo, Garnacha, Verdejo and Viura. Now let's shimmy our way to Germany, where a group of quality obsessed winemakers from the Verbon Deutsche Predikats Weingute, or VDP for short. These rebels go above and beyond German wine laws, holding themselves to a higher standard for viticulture and winemaking. Members earn the privilege of displaying the VDP emblem on their bottles, typically on the capsules and labels. And when you spot Gigi, either on the glass bottle itself or the label, you're in the presence of some of the greatest wines ever made in the world.
these great groats definitely give Burgundy's Grand Cru's a run for their money. And if you come across the term Esters Gewacht, it's akin to a premier crew wine. A train ride away to Austria to meet the OTW, the traditional wine estates of Austria. Like the VDP, they're a voluntary alliance of producers all about consistent quality and terroir. At the top tier are single vineyards called Erste Lager, broken down into a further three, quite similar to the Grand and Premier Cruz of Burgundy. But being part of this gang is really difficult. They're like the eco-warriors of the wine world. In addition to high standards of grape growing and wine making, members also have to be certified sustainable or organic with no use of herbicides or insecticides whatsoever. And that's a wrap, folks. That's it for part one of how to read wine labels. I doubt your attention span can withstand any more details on wine laws, so do stay tuned for part two. We'll be covering other common quality terms and indications and some differences in key environmental pro-labeling. And as a special treat, I'll even break down key varieties in the most famous European regions that don't usually include varietals on their labels. Till next week, here's to amazing health. Thank you.